Countries from around the world have reached a historic agreement to preserve an area of the ocean near Antarctica. But there have been numerous deals in the past to tackle climate change and its adverse impact on wildlife. So how is this any different? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Dedi Nabugeda. It's taken six years of negotiations, but finally, 24 countries and the EU all agreed on creating the world's first international marine protected area. It will be in the Ross Sea near Antarctica. The area is considered to be one of the most pristine marine environments in the world and it covers more than one and a half million square kilometers of ocean. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, Andrew Thomas sets up our discussion from Hobart. In Hobart, there were hugs and one happy penguin. After six years of talks, 24 countries and the European Union have reached agreement for a marine protected area for the more than 1.5 million square kilometre Ross Sea in Antarctica, an area of ocean and ice the size of Germany, France and Spain combined. We're ecstatic, I would say. Um, it's been a really long road to get here, but um, it's been worth the effort. It's historic. Kids will learn about this. The 28th of October 2016 is the day when countries have come together, countries have united to create the first large-scale marine protected area in the high seas. When the deal takes effect next December, all fishing, mineral exploration and whaling will be banned. The hope is to preserve the world's most pristine environment so wildlife can thrive. But it should also help research into global warming. Antarctica, more than 3,000 kilometers in that direction is where the impacts of climate change are being felt faster and more acutely than anywhere else on Earth. Scientists now will be able to separate the impact of global climate change from human activity in the Antarctic. If there are changes happening that can't be explained by fishing, then it has to be climate change, because otherwise what, is the, what are the other factors that could be taking place? There are none. We've removed the fishing factor and there are no other extractive activities allowed in the Ross Sea. For years, consensus was blocked last year by Russia. Some delegates think it had ambitions to expand its currently small tooth fishing operations. Others believe the Russians were worried about giving up the right to claim mineral resources or the precedent such a large-scale marine protection area could set elsewhere. But the chair of the talks, a Russian himself, says it was nothing so cynical. Russia simply wanted the right deal. Like in diplomacy, it's a tricky game. It's like a chess, chess game, but finally you, get, you have the result. One compromise, a 35-year time limit. Most in Hobart, though, hope that will get extended and that the Ross Sea is just the beginning. Andrew Thomas, Al Jazeera, Hobart. So let's learn more about the Ross Sea. As we mentioned, it's considered to be one of the most pristine environments in the world. New Zealand officials say that at different times, the area is home to about a third of the world's Adelie penguins and 26% of the world's emperor penguins. It also boasts thriving colonies of seabirds, seals and whales. The Ross Sea is home to huge numbers of krill as well, a staple food for species including whales and seals. Their oil is critical for salmon farming. But there are concerns that overfishing and climate change are having significant impacts on their numbers. Let's talk about this. Bring in our guests. In London, we have Lewis Pugh. He's an ocean advocate and maritime lawyer. He's also patron of the oceans with the United Nations Environment Programme. And joining us on Skype from Hobart, Australia, is Rod Downey. He's the Polar Programme Manager with the World Wildlife Fund, UK. Hey, welcome uh, to you, gentlemen. Lewis Pugh, you were a major player in getting this agreement. It's been hailed as a milestone in conservation. How so? Uh, for a number of reasons. I think the main reason is because this is the, the first major uh, marine protected area in the high seas. So the high seas are those areas beyond uh, national jurisdictions. Uh, up to date, they're largely unprotected. Uh, this sets, I hope, a precedent for other 
large-scale marine protected areas, not only around Antarctica, hopefully, but also in the rest of the high seas around the world. We'll talk about whether it sets a precedent in a moment, but first, Rod Downey, obviously you hail this agreement as well, being from the World Wildlife Fund UK, but I understand that you say it's just a start. Can you explain that? Yeah, that's right. So, so it's certainly a historic agreement to protect the Ross Sea. Um, and I would agree that it's a milestone for the conservation um, of some of the most amazing and iconic species that we have on our planet, species like the emperor penguins or Adelie penguins. Um, what we've seen, uh, not only over the last couple of weeks, but actually over about a decade, is that 24 countries around the world, plus the European Union, have worked tire tirelessly to, to protect one and a half million square kilometers of the Southern Ocean. That's about six times the size of the UK. But you're right, this is just a start. Um, the current measures that we agreed today here in Hobart only last for 35 years. Now, that's not far enough. Marine protected areas need to be designated and protected into per per perpetuity, so forever. Uh, so what we would like to see is a more permanent and more enduring protection, which will last for future generations. Lewis, why was this agreement just set for 35 years? And how do you keep this going past the 35 years? We understand from the negotiations that China is on the record, and it was stating that it only wanted it for 20 years. So how did you get around that? Well, I was involved in the negotiations with Russia. So the, 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 the major block which occurred in the last few years uh, three years ago, it was Russia and China. Last year, it was just Russia. And then this year, it was trying to get Russia across the line. There have been a, a number of blockages in these negotiations. Uh, the sunset clause, so whether it would be 35 years or 20 years, was just one aspect that had to be sorted out. So obviously, the, the environmental groups like, like, like Greenpeace, WWF, uh, ASOC, all these type of groups, have been saying that they want this to be in perpetuity. So for example, you wouldn't have a national park on land. So for example, the Serengeti or the Kruger National Park or Yellowstone, you wouldn't have that for 20, 30 years. You have that you know, and, you know, for, 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 forever. And what they were concerned about was that this would set a precedent also in other marine protected areas and also in, on land national parks that they could be for just a short period of time, and then you could start hunting or fishing again in them. One has to appreciate, though, that these deals are, are, are deals of compromise. There were 24 nations plus the European Union. And these are nations who have some very, very strong differing views about how to protect our oceans. I think it's a very, very good start. I'm hoping that in 35 years' time, when this issue is discussed again, that it'll be you know, made longer and hopefully also in perpetuity. But how do you plan, if there is a plan, uh, to keep this going after 35 years? Or are you just not there yet and the, and the concern was to get this agreement uh, signed? Well, you know, these, these negotiations, so the actual, the, the call for this national, for this marine protected area, uh, started about 14 years ago. It, it was an American scientist called David Ainley who 14 years ago was doing research down in Rossi and said, we need to protect this area. So this has been going on for 14 years. Uh, the actual votes have taken place in the last five years. The concern was that if you keep on going on and on and on with these negotiations and never succeeding, never actually getting to a deal, that the parties would then give up. I think that what has been achieved today was the very, very best deal which could have been achieved in the circumstances. And one also must bear in mind that, yes, the sunset clause was just part of it, but one also must appreciate that it was America that proposed this national park or this marine protected area with New Zealand. And this was proposed uh, at a time when geopolitically the issues between America and Russia principally are very, very strained. So getting this past all these parties, trying to get 25 parties to agree a deal was a momentous occasion. It was a huge, huge, uh, so, to try to get them all to agree 
is a major is a major thing. I, I, I think what has been achieved is absolutely incredible, given the, the geopolitical circumstances. It does sound like that. Rod, I see you nodding along. I'll come over to you in just a moment. But if I may, Lewis, let me ask you about original plans. From what I understand, they were to create two sanctuaries, so one in the Ross Sea and one in the East Antarctica. East Antarctica, not part of this deal. Why not? The, the, the parties meet. They meet for two, for two weeks every single year in Hobart, okay? And it takes an awful long time to get through all the issues. I think that the, what, what I'm hoping will happen is that next year we'll deal, deal with East Antarctica. That was proposed by Australia and the European Union. And there also another, uh, a, another marine protected area also proposed in the Weddell Sea. Uh, I'm hoping this is a first step, okay? I, more than, more than most people, would like to see marine protected areas all over Antarctica. This is a very, very important part of the world and definitely needs protecting. Okay, uh, Rod, from what you understand, what sort of mechanisms are going to be put in place to uh, monitor uh, this deal? Um, so, in terms of monitoring, so um, as part of the management um, provisions for the Ross Sea, They'll, they'll establish a, a research and monitoring plan. So marine protected areas fulfill a number of functions. One, of course, is conservation and protection of the, 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 the incredibly unique and iconic species that live there. But it's also a place for science. And I think that by um, designating the Ross Sea as a marine protected area, that will encourage more science to be done in the area. We'll get to understand um, the 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 unique uh, habitats uh, and the unique functions of the Ross Sea region. So it'll attract effect, it'll um, act as a, in effect, as a honeypot for science to attract further science to be done in the region. And I think that's really important. Uh, Lewis, I see you agree with that statement uh, from Rod. What kind of science are you hoping will be achieved in that region? What kind of research uh, will come out of this agreement? Well, I was speaking to David Ainley a, a, a few days ago and he said, he said, Lewis, the Ross Sea is just far more valuable as a place for research than it is as a fishing ground. And I can't agree more. I mean, this is truly the last wilderness area uh, on Earth. It is, I describe it as a polar garden of Eden. You know, when you arrive down in the Ross Sea, it is something to behold. You know, the, there is obviously huge amounts of sea ice, there are enormous grades. Uh, icebergs, you've got beautiful emperor penguins, you've got smaller Delhi penguins, you've got Weddell seals, you've got leopard seals, you've got humpback whales. This area is like a living laboratory for scientists. They can study uh, the most pristine ecosystem left on this planet and from that they can learn what a healthy ecosystem should look like. It's absolutely invaluable science. To ruin this by allowing industrial fish fishing uh, would have been very, very short-sighted. Uh, Rod, you've mentioned that this is one of nine areas to be protected. What are the uh, steps and what is the end goal here? Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the end goal is that we would like to see a representative network of protected yeah, let, areas let, 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 stretching right around the Antarctic continent. So there's nine areas that we're focused on. The Ross Sea is one of those, and it's been a great success this week. But there, there are still eight other areas that we're working in or planning new networks of marine protected areas. So we have uh, East Antarctica, um, which, as Lewis said, it has been proposed by Australia and the European Union. We're also working on the Weddell Sea, um, which is another proposal that's coming through from the European Union. Uh, the Weddell Sea is particularly unique. It's possibly the, the last major sea in the world ever to have, any, to have had any commercial fishing activity going on. So it's a really special place as well. Uh, We're also working down on the Antarctic Peninsula, um, and that region is, 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 is really critical. That's one of the fastest warming places in the Southern Hemisphere as, as a result of climate change. So, uh, yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done, but this is a, a great, great start. And on the issue of the Weddell Sea, uh, reports are, uh, there are reports, in fact, that uh, there should be some sort of agreement or some sort of proposal that will be put forward next year. Is that correct? And, and how does this agreement in the Antarctic pave the way for an agreement on the Weddell Sea? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, the Weddell Sea proposal was put forward this year. So we now have three proposals on the table. Um, but these things don't get agreed overnight. You know, we've learned that. Um, still a lot of negotiation to, to go through. But um, I, I think that now having the precedent for the Weddell Sea, 
uh, I, I beg your pardon. Now having the precedent for the Ross Sea, um, I, I think we we have a lot to um, to learn from this experience. Um, things that have gone well, things that haven't gone so well, um, and I think we can build on that and really create a a truly effective network of marine protected areas right around the Southern Ocean. Lewis, can you elaborate a little bit on what these no-take zone areas are going to be? Because we understand that a lot of this area is going to be designated as a no-take zone. What is that exactly? Well, it's an area where there's no fishing will be allowed. Um, and, and that's absolutely crucial in order for the, uh, for the, for the area to, uh, you know, to, to restore back, back to its, its normal, uh, back, to, back to how it was before man started touching it. So there, there are areas where there will be research allowed and there are areas uh, where there will also be fishing allowed. And this agreement, does it cover other, other oceans at all? No, not at all. So this, this is, is just dealing with the Ross Sea. It's just dealing with an area uh, south, of, south of New Zealand, uh, down in the Southern Ocean. It doesn't impact any other area in the world. Not the first deal that we've seen on the high seas. Now, we saw a deal in 2009 with the South Orkney Islands. That's in the South Atlantic. How is this any different? So the one with the South Orkney Island was done under a different convention. It was done under the Antarctic Treaty System. Uh, it's a much smaller one. This was done under Camelot. Uh, this one required the consensus of, of, of 24 countries and the European Union. Uh, I mean, just in terms of size, they are completely different. I think it was described in the beginning that this, this new one is the biggest protected area ever in history. Okay? It's the size of Britain, France, Germany, Italy, all put together. It's absolutely enormous. Lewis, is there anything that can be learned from the South Orkney deal uh, that can be implemented with this uh, deal? I don't think so. You know, I, I, I think that this, this, is the, this has been the main one which Kamala has had to deal with. And the lessons which we've learned here uh, will then be taken forward through to the Weddell Sea and hopefully also to East Antarctica and also through to, to, to the peninsula. I think the, the main lesson which, which I think came from this is that to try and get consensus with 24 nations and the European Union when there's difficult political circumstances happening outside is very, very challenging. And that perhaps it's important that the, the countries proposing these marine protected areas are not great big superpowers. So it would, it would always have been a difficult circumstance when you have America proposing the deal, all in good faith. But when you have America proposing the deal and then there was conflict between the United States of America and, other, uh, and, and Russia, it was always going to be a difficult circumstance to get that through. But they were successful. It's, it's, it really is a, a testament to, to the diplomats, what, what they were able to achieve here. Rod, do you believe that times could be perhaps changing and there is the political will now to get uh, deals going, not only when it comes to marine converse, uh, conservation, but also when it comes to climate change? We've seen many failures there. We've seen the Kyoto Protocol fail. We've seen the uh, Copenhagen talks fail. Um, yeah, that's that, that, that's right. But we have seen um, the Paris Agreement. Uh, so we had uh, 196 countries who came to an agreement in, in, at the COP in Paris to, to, to really make a difference and tackle climate change. So, um, But to be honest, I think perhaps um, more importantly, and, and bringing it back to Antarctica, um, we have the Antarctic Treaty System, uh, which is in place. Now, Camelar, which is the body under which... Um, the agreements were made today is part of that Antarctic Treaty system, and uh, the, the, the 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 Antarctic Treaty has been in force for more than 50 years, and and is still holding um, true today. Uh, a, a major feature of the Antarctic Treaty is that it is that it um, has a huge focus on cooperation, on on peace and science in Antarctica, and uh, I think it's been an amazing uh, agreement that many nations around the world have signed up to and um, so yes I, I, I think but it's when a, you were it, mentioning it, it, the Paris agreement just a moment ago why was this agreement this Antarctic agreement rod not covered last year at the end of the Paris talks I'm sorry I didn't understand your question which, why, which agreement not not this agreement that we saw with Antarctica 
is there a reason why it was not covered at the end of the Paris talks last year? Is there a connection there? They're two completely different conventions. So, so um, CAMELA is is the, which stands for the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, has competence, competency over um, conservation in the Southern Ocean. Um, COP, COP 21 couldn't have achieved that. It, it's it's a different convention. Okay, and on the subject of climate change, Rod, let me ask you, is it difficult to trace the causes and the actual real-time effects of uh, climate change and its impact on wildlife? If you look in Antarctica, um, so we're seeing uh, climate change. You, you, it, it really is the front line, line of climate change in part of Antarctica. Right. Um, and it, it, it's a unique place where we can drill ice cores, which can tell us, which, which give us an archive of, of climate change going back over hundreds of thousands of years. So we know exactly what, what's happened in the past, and that helps us to, to project and to predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, in a place like the Antarctic Peninsula, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. So, um, for example, we're seeing um, Adelie penguins um, losing out to other species of, 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 of penguins as a direct consequence of climate change. Okay, and uh, Lewis, how does the protection, the exact protection of the Ross Sea help scientists? We spoke about scientists a moment, a moment ago, but how do they help them actually separate the impact of global climate change uh, from human activity? I, I, I think this deal helps, helps politicians as well, as opposed to scientists. Obviously, it helps scientists. It, it, it cordons off an area of the Ross Sea where they can do their research uh, but it really, I think it really helps politicians. So in 1959, at the height of the Cold War, the Antarctic Treaty System was put in place. Twelve countries came together and set aside Antarctica as a place for peace and science. What this deal today has shown us is that Antarctica continues to be a place for peace, for science, for dialogue, for cooperation. And what we're hoping is that what has been achieved here today can ripple through to other areas of the world where there is tension. Let me ask you a, a final question, Lewis, because you have uh, you said you've been down to the Ross Sea, you have swam in the Antarctica, in fact, and there's a fact here. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature is recommending that 30 percent of all the world's oceans be protected. In your opinion, from what you've seen, what happens if they're not? Well, I mean, if you, if you look at the world's oceans right now, uh, about 90% of the world's big fish have been taken out of our oceans, okay? 90% of the big fish taken out of our oceans. Uh, if you look at a big predator species like the shark, about 100 million sharks are slaughtered every single year. You work that out on a daily basis, that's about 270,000 each day. It's totally unsustainable. We're totally fishing our oceans out. Uh, there was an urgent need to get a grip about what was happening because, because as the Atlantic, as the Indian Ocean, as the Pacific were being fished out, the major industrial fishing fleets were now going down into Antarctica and also going up into the Arctic to look for the last big fish. These places needed to be protected. These species needed, needed to be protected. What has happened today is historic and it's certainly to be celebrated. Rod, how can this momentum in the world to protect the seas uh, be built on? Final words for you. Yeah, well, what we've seen today is a, a, a unique solution which was created by a unique conservation body um, for a very, very unique place, which is the Ross Sea. But it, it, it sets a great precedent for cooperation and collaboration on science, uh, on conservation, uh, to really make a difference to Antarctica. You know, we can do this. All right. Well, I wish you... Gentlemen, the best of luck. Thank you very much for joining us on Inside Story. Lewis Pugh in London and Rod Downey speaking to us from Hobart. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from myself and the whole team here in Doha. Goodbye for now.